In late 2001, as an officer patrolling near Las Vegas, New Mexico, I found myself in a mountainous rural area surrounded by the stillness of the early morning. My partner and I sat inside our fully marked police cruiser parked by the roadside next to a dense thicket of dark woods. Daylight was just beginning to break, allowing us to see clearly through the windows without the need for headlights. As we engaged in conversation, my partner diligently filled out paperwork oblivious to the imminent encounter that was about to unfold. It was approximately 5 a.m., and the world was slowly waking up around us. Suddenly, our attention was drawn to movement at the edge of the bushes, where there was no discernible path or roadway. With bated breath, we watched as a massive figure emerged from the undergrowth, making its way toward us. The creature had four legs, hooves pounding the ground, but what struck us most were its long, muscular arms swinging back and forth, resembling the movements of an ape. In a short span of time, it took for the headlights to circle through the windshield. The creature covered a distance of about a hundred yards. Our hearts raced as we realized the sheer size of the entity. Standing at least eight feet tall, it loomed over us. Reacting instinctively, my partner and I leapt out of the car. He reached for his firearm while I, opting for a non-confrontational approach, cautiously moved towards the creature. It seemed to recognize my lack of aggression and swiftly disappeared into the depths of the surrounding woods, moving with an uncanny agility on all fours. Driven by curiosity and a sense of duty, I ventured into the same woods hoping to track the elusive creature. To my surprise, there was no trace of any disturbance or evidence of its passage through the dense brush. It was as if the creature had vanished into thin air. There was no sign of human tracks or any indication that someone had sprinted through that very spot. It was a baffling mystery, leaving me with more questions than answers. In my quest for understanding, I reached out to fellow officers in neighboring towns, and they shared similar reports of a wild man roaming the area. Other accounts emerged, speaking of startled horses and the discovery of large human-like footprints in their vicinity. Our department devoted significant time and resources to tracking down the elusive creature, but our efforts proved fruitless. It seemed that our encounter was a fleeting glimpse of a phenomenon that defied explanation. As the days turned into weeks, the creature remained elusive, fading into the depths of local folklore. It became a tale shared among law enforcement in the local community, an enigmatic presence lurking in the memories of those who had witnessed it. While we never laid eyes on the creature again, the encounter served as a reminder of the mysteries that lie within the vastness of our world, waiting to be unraveled. January 1st, 1992 it was the early morning, and my wife and I were making our way back to Cindy from a fun day of sledding at Mount Hood. We were about six, seven miles from government camp, Oregon, when something caught our attention. As we rounded a curve, we spotted a figure standing in the foot, deep snow near the creek. Intrigued, I decided to stop the car and get a closer look. I walked over to where the mysterious being stood, but as I approached, it gave me a disdainful glance as if telling me to back off. Without further hesitation, it crossed the road and swiftly ran up a nearby bank. I stood there mesmerized for a total of three, four minutes, trying to process what I had just witnessed. The creature was truly awe-inspiring. It stood between seven to eight feet tall and had massive thighs and a remarkably broad waist, perhaps indicating that it was pregnant. Its arms hung down, extending to its knees, and its face was devoid of any hair. The skin on its face had a light leather color, while the rest of its body was covered in dark reddish-black hair with patches of chocolate hues mixed in. The hair on its body was approximately two, three inches long, while the hair on its head reached around four inches in length. The encounter left us both intrigued and curious. We wanted to explore further, so on the 2nd of January, my friend Scott and I, along with a group from Salem, ventured back to the area to see if we could find any traces of the enigmatic creature. 
One of the members of our group diligently tracked the Bigfoot for four or five miles through the treacherous snow-covered terrain. The snow was often four feet deep, making the task even more challenging. Eventually, however, the tracker had to give up and return, unable to keep up with the elusive creature. During our expedition, we managed to capture photographs of the distinct string of footprints left behind in the snow. These images served as evidence of our journey and the encounter we had experienced. It was a thrilling adventure, tinged with a mix of wonder and fascination. To this day, that encounter remains etched in my memory, serving as a constant reminder of the mysteries that surround us. The photographs and the stories we shared serve as testament to the existence of creatures that defy conventional explanations. It was a glimpse into a world that exists beyond our understanding, and it sparked a lifelong curiosity in me to unravel the secrets of the unknown. I've been hesitant to share this story, but it's been weighing on my mind for over a year now. It's a strange occurrence that happened one morning, and I still can't find a logical explanation for it. So here goes. I should mention that I'm a heavy sleeper, relying on multiple alarms to wake me up in the morning. Sudden noises around the house rarely disrupt my slumber. However, on this particular morning, something happened that jolted me awake. I heard my mom's voice shouting, For God's sake! The sound came from the hallway just outside my bedroom door. At first, I assumed she was scolding our cat for getting into some mischief. Feeling groggy, I chose to ignore it and attempted to drift back to sleep. But before I could fully succumb to slumber, I heard the creaking of my bedroom door opening. My mom entered, her face filled with concern. What's wrong, she asked, confused by her question. I rode over and replied, nothing. I didn't say anything. Her expression became even more bewildered, and she insisted, but you shouted for me. I couldn't comprehend what she was saying because I knew I hadn't uttered a word. In fact, I never sleep talk, neither before nor after this incident. It simply wasn't something I did. The situation grew stranger when I realized that we both heard each other's voices saying completely different things. It was as if there were two parallel conversations taking place. How could this be? It couldn't have been an external person since we live alone. So who or what could have spoken those words? To this day, this baffling incident still unnerves me. I've racked my brain trying to find a rational explanation, but nothing seems to fit. If anyone out there can shed some light on this or has experienced something similar, please share your insights. I'm eager to find some semblance of understanding and put this eerie mystery to rest. When you move to a new place, you expect surprises. New faces, new paths, new experiences. But when my brother and I moved into our new house, we discovered something we could never have anticipated. The house was nestled against expansive backwoods, an open invitation to exploration and adventure. Being nature enthusiasts, we were thrilled by the opportunity to have our very own wilderness to traverse. We laced up our boots and decided to explore our new playground one sunny afternoon, not knowing the chilling encounter that lay ahead. Our hike led us into a quaint open grass field, a startling contrast to the dense woods we'd just navigated, an island of green amidst a sea of trees. There, in the center of this unexpected meadow, was a figure hunched over in a blue jacket. We assumed it was a friend we'd made recently. I didn't have my glasses on, but the familiar blue jacket seemed a good enough sign. So, with a grin, I jogged across the field, excited to surprise our friend. As I approached the figure, I soon realized our mistake. It wasn't our friend. It was a man, a stranger. He was crouched over the carcass of a deer, brutally jabbing at it with a blunt stick. The sight was macabre. A horrifying scene framed by the serene beauty of the meadow. I froze in place as a man raised his head, his eyes meeting mine. Fear took hold, adrenaline pumping through my veins as my heart pounded against my ribcage. I turned on my heel, shouting at my brother to run. 
The joyful exploration had turned into a terrifying chase as we sprinted back through the woods. The memory of that day still sends chills down my spine. The tranquil beauty of our backwoods forever marred by the unsettling encounter. We learned something important that day. Our new home held surprises all right, but some were far more disturbing than we could ever have imagined. I'm a ranger in Yosemite National Park, and I believe I've witnessed something that people refer to as a real-life alien spaceship. I even had the audacity to touch it with my bare hands. It was a few years back when I was still quite new to the job on May 7, 2003, to be exact. I was assigned to patrol an area due to reports of strange sounds being heard every night past midnight. There were also rumors of dazzling light shows resembling full laser displays. Some speculated that teenagers were having parties in the woods as the reason behind these noises. But deep down, I knew that explanation didn't make any sense. A couple of rangers had already been investigating the case, but with little progress. That's when I was added to the team. At twenty, three years old... Full of enthusiasm to solve the mystery, I delved into every aspect of the investigation. I meticulously gathered testimonies from witnesses, surveyed the entire area, and tracked possible suspects. I even started camping in the suspected sites. Night after night, I immersed myself in the darkness of the woods, becoming intimately familiar with the creatures that emerged when the sun set. I witnessed unexplainable phenomena. An unexplained disappearance of a human right before my eyes, insects glowing with a mesmerizing flicker of light. I documented everything, but unfortunately in 2003, phone cameras were not as accessible as they are now. So I had no clear evidence of these extraordinary occurrences. It was during the last night at the final location on the list when everything changed. As the clock neared five, I was setting up camp when suddenly all my gadgets emitted strange static noises. Initially, I considered the possibility of equipment failure and thought about heading back, but something felt off. The day before, everything was functioning perfectly fine. Nonetheless, after a few minutes, the strange static ceased and everything returned to normal. With little hope of finding answers, I shared my discoveries with my fellow rangers. Some believed me, while others laughed it off. To those who believed, they mentioned having witnessed similar phenomena, but failing to find any trace of it upon returning to investigate. It seemed to appear and vanish in the right place at the right time, defying rational explanation. With a glimmer of hope, I returned to the exact spot where the specter had presented itself. I moved around the area, searching every nook and cranny, but to no avail. It was truly gone. As I sat down to have my dinner, the full moon cast its radiant glow, illuminating the surroundings. Lost in my thoughts, I caught a sudden flash of light in my peripheral vision. It was momentary, but showed me the way. Intrigued, I followed the direction of the light, and soon enough my walkie-talkie began emitting an intense, unsettling static noise. Fearing it might alert whatever entity was responsible, I swiftly turned it off. With a mix of excitement and trepidation, I scoured the area until finally, at around 10 p.m., I stumbled upon an awe-inspiring sight. Before me floated a colossal structure resembling an egg with rings like Saturn, slowly ascending into the night sky. Its metallic surface emitted an otherworldly glow reflecting the moon's light. I hid behind a nearby tree, my heart pounding in my chest. This was it. This was a revelation of an unseen side of our world, and I was an astonished witness to it, crouching down. I observed the object with bated breath. It hovered, surrounded by its rotating rings, an enigmatic spectacle. It was pitch black, and its presence emanated a deep engine, like rumble. I marveled at its presence, captivated by the sheer magnitude of the moment. Suddenly the stillness shattered as the outer shell of the object began to crack. The rings on its surface emitted a neon blue light, reminiscent of an ethereal glow. It was a sight beyond comprehension, defying any earthly explanation. 
My eyes remained fixated on the spectacle as four metallic pipes extended from the craft, acting as sturdy supports. It stood there frozen in place, and I dared not make a sound. Time seemed to blur as I crouched there, overwhelmed by a mixture of awe and fear. Hours passed, but nothing else transpired. The cracks on the surface of the object closed, returning it to its original form. An eerie stillness settled over the surroundings as the craft slowly began to rise, its presence dominating the night sky. Driven by curiosity and a thirst for answers, I mustered the courage to approach the vessel cautiously. Every movement was deliberate as I crawled on all fours, avoiding any unnecessary noise. With each painstaking inch, I drew closer to the enigmatic craft, anticipation surging through my veins. Finally, I reached out, extending my hand to touch the metallic surface. The sensation was surreal, a smooth, cool texture beneath my fingertips. It was a moment of connection, a tangible encounter with the unknown. However, as I prepared to caress the craft, a high-pitched noise pierced the air, reverberating through my eardrums. The intensity was overwhelming, causing me to clutch my ears in agony. The next thing I knew, I awakened in a hospital bed, disoriented and bewildered. I had been found unconscious by a fellow ranger and rushed to the hospital when I failed to regain consciousness. The details surrounding my sudden collapse remained a mystery, but I knew deep down that my encounter with the otherworldly craft had played a part. Since that fateful day, I've become even more determined to uncover concrete evidence of their existence. The encounter, the warning signal of the high-pitched noise, and the subsequent disappearance of the craft all reinforced my belief that these beings walked among us, observing from the shadows. They were aware of our presence, and perhaps they had become more cautious, making their activities less frequent and conspicuous. Armed with my conviction, I continue my search for proof, hoping to share my extraordinary experiences with those willing to listen. The encounter with the alien ship had forever altered my perception of the world, reminding me that there is still so much left to uncover. As a ranger in Yosemite National Park, I stand as a guardian of the uncharted, forever vigilant, and forever seeking answers to the mysteries that lie within the vastness of the unknown. This story was one that my dad told me after I told him about the experience I had. The story goes it was late afternoon, early evening, when my dad let the family dog out. The dog was outside making a strange sound, almost a growling, whinnying sound. My father went out to see what was wrong when he seen a brownish creature leaning against the tree, with one arm resting on tree. From where my dad stood, he could see the side of this thing. He said it stood around seven feet tall and it had hair hanging down from this arm. The dog still making sounds, my father yelled at him to come. This thing then turned and faced my father, looked at him for around ten. Fifteen seconds, then casual walked off into the woods that surrounded our home. My father said the thing was around fifty, one hundred yards away from him. After the incident, my father went out to the tree it was leaning against and found some brownish hair. He didn't tell anyone till 95 when I called telling him I had just saw a Bigfoot. He then told me this story. Where I seen a creature passed on the roadway was less than five miles from where my dad seen one by our home. Give me goosebumps just thinking about it. You don't know how many times I walked home late at night from a friend's house out in the boonies with just a flashlight. I wouldn't do that again for nothing. The secluded and dangerous part of the National Forest was our sanctuary, my refuge from the monotony of everyday life. I'm Jack, an avid hunter, and I had a tight-knit troop of five friends who shared my passion for the wild and the thrill of the hunt. Our adventures in this untamed territory were the stuff of legends, but one particular hunt would etch itself into our memory like a scar, a mark that could never be erased. The dense forest was home to wild wolves and bears, making it a challenging and perilous hunting ground. 
We'd always taken precautions, but this time we ventured even deeper into the heart of the wilderness, where the dangers were greater and the odds more unpredictable. It was a crisp autumn day when we set out, rifles in hand and determination in our hearts. As we trod deeper into the woods, a sense of trepidation hung in the air. The towering trees cast long shadows, and the silence was only occasionally broken by the distant hut of an owl or the rustling of leaves. Our loyal dogs, a pack of seasoned hounds, sniffed the ground and growled uneasily, sensing something amiss. And then it happened. A shadowy figure emerged from the dense underbrush. It stood on two skinny hind legs, its arms so impossibly long that they reached the ground like a gorilla leaning backward. My heart pounded in my chest as I locked eyes with this grotesque creature. Its spine was crooked, giving it an eerie, unsettling posture. It resembled a terminal anorexic bull, its deformed face lacking horns but sporting a shaggy neck mane. Its skin was an eerie moonlight gray, and its eyes shone with an unnatural, otherworldly light. Fear surged through my veins as I realized the creature was real, not some figment of my imagination. Panic spread among my friends, but we were hunters, and we knew we had to defend ourselves. Our rifles were our only hope. The creature attacked with a speed and ferocity that defied its skeletal frame. In the midst of the battle, Two of my friends fell to its relentless assault, their screams echoing through the forest. The rest of us fired our rifles, bullets tearing into the creature's grotesque form. It howled in agony but pressed on, its malevolent eyes locked on to me. Desperation gave us strength and we continued firing until the creature finally collapsed to the ground. We watched it with a mixture of relief and horror as its body twitched and convulsed blood pooled around it, staining the forest floor. But then, as we cautiously approached to examine the fallen predator, a chilling realization washed over us. Its body was slowly evaporating, dissolving into thin air before our eyes. We stared in disbelief as the moonlight gray skin faded into nothingness, leaving behind only a faint, lingering scent of something otherworldly. Confusion and fear gripped us as we exchanged bewildered glances. What had we just encountered? There were no answers, only questions that lingered like a haunting specter in our minds. We retreated from that cursed place, carrying the memory of that inexplicable encounter with us. The forest held secrets beyond our understanding, and that night we had brushed against the boundaries of the unknown. As we mourned the loss of our friends, we were left with a chilling reminder that some mysteries were not meant to be unraveled and some horrors were best left forgotten. I was deep in the wilderness, backpacking with my faithful dog, miles away from civilization. It was just the two of us, surrounded by the serene beauty of nature. We had encountered no other hikers throughout the day, making the solitude even more pronounced. In the dead of night, around 2 a.m., my dog's growl startled me awake. I quickly turned on my headlamp and saw his teeth bared, his instincts on high alert. Something was amiss. I strained my ears and heard heavy footsteps approaching our tent. The possibility of a black bear or, or a moose crossed my mind. Taking swift action, I leashed my dog, ensuring he couldn't charge through the tent. As I did so, the footsteps receded, but continued to circle around our campsite. Confusion clouded my mind. I had properly stored all food and toiletries in a bear bag, eliminating padded bag, eliminating any potential attractants. I clapped my hands, hoping to deter whatever was circling us. Yet the slow, deliberate movements persisted, behavior more peculiar for a human than a moose or a bear seeking food. Gathering my courage, I made a decision. Gripping the leash in one hand and clutching bear spray in the other, I stepped out of the tent, raising my voice and shouting, He bear! The footsteps abruptly halted, and my dog's keen senses directed my attention to the right. However, my headlamp revealed nothing. There was no sound of a retreat, only an eerie silence. Giving it a few minutes, I cautiously returned to the tent, still on edge. 
but before long the unsettling circling resumed approximately 50 feet away from us. It continued for what felt like an hour, a constant reminder of an unseen presence lurking in the darkness. Eventually the footsteps wandered off into the depths of the woods, disappearing with the dawn. As morning broke, I decided to investigate. Equipped with my dog and the bear spray, I began searching for tracks. Amongst the fallen leaves, I discovered a clear path that had been trampled, but no discernible footprints. My dog's nose led us further, tracing the loop around our campsite. And there, in the midst of nature's splendor, I came across a chilling discovery. A few unmistakable human footprints, bare and of regular size, adorned the ground. It was clear that someone, a stranger, had ventured into the remote wilderness, intruding upon our solitude and encircling my tent for over an hour. Adding to the eerie revelation, a human turd and scattered toilet paper lay as evidence of their presence, a disturbing reminder that an individual, possibly with malicious intent, had violated the sanctity of the wilderness. There's a spot in Kentucky in the Daniel Boone National Forest that always has and always will creep me out. My father has told me stories of him fishing around dusk with his cousin in this place. A branch of the local lake leads out this way through the hills. This one time they're out fishing and about head home when they start hearing noises coming from the surrounding forest. Keep in mind there's a dead-end road here and there's only one way in and out of this canyon. There are no houses and no other roads into this place. Out from the woods people come, and they don't say a word. My dad claims that they looked unwashed, clothes torn, just staring them down, like something out of deliverance. I guess my dad or his cousin flashed a pistol, and they both just backed off toward their truck and drove off. This other time I'm camping out there with a friend. This is sort of toward the end of the same road, which would be maybe five, six miles long until it hits a dead end. As we're sitting around the fire around midnight, we begin to hear forest noises. No big deal, right? Could be a deer or a raccoon or possum or something shuffling about. Then we begin to hear splashes further away in the water. It sounded like maybe a carp was splashing around, and it sounded pretty far off at that. No big deal. The shuffling gets louder from all sides, and the splashing increases in volume as well as frequency until it feels like something is right on top of us. We have no idea what so we drop everything and hop in my truck and drive off. After many discussions, we have never arrived at a conclusion, and we have never gone back. It was in the early hours of the morning on a particular day in the early 2000s when a middle-aged woman was found unconscious on the road in a Dewanya, Kuwait suburb. When she was taken to the hospital, she had a horrific story to tell the authorities. Apparently, she was a musician, and she had been hired to provide entertainment for a gathering in a large villa in a neighborhood she was found in. As the night went on, however, she came to realize that a number of her clients weren't entirely human. She tried to escape and evidently failed. This happened in Dewanya, Kuwait in Western Asia. In the early 2000s, stories appeared in the Kuwaiti media detailing the run, in that a hapless victim had with beings that would normally be confined to the dark reaches of mythology and folklore. The musician was a middle-aged woman who plays a traditional Kuwaiti instrument. She received a call from a prospective client who wanted to hire her for her services during the month of Ramadan. Since it is inappropriate to perform music during Ramadan, the witness initially refused, but the caller insisted and tripled her usual fee, eventually persuading her to go. The caller sent their own driver to pick her up. And what began as a usual musical event suddenly took a sharp turn for the supernatural. The party started early in the evening but continued on until 12 a.m., at which point some of the attendees began to act bizarrely. A group of young girls at the center of the room, for example, started to dance very aggressively. They moved in such a vigorous manner that their legs began showing under their long dresses. 
revealing that their legs were not, in fact, those of humans, but rather bore a closer resemblance to the horse's legs. Terrified, the woman ran out of the party where she found the driver who had picked her up waiting for her. She quickly got into the car and refused to comment when the driver asked her what was wrong due to being too distraught to speak coherently. After a couple of minutes, however, she had calmed down enough to be asked again by the driver. She told him that some of the partygoers did not have human legs, prompting the driver to reply, You mean just like mine? Before revealing his legs under his clothes, like the young girls at the gathering, they were those of an animal. The woman was hysterical with fear at this point, and so threw herself from the car and landed on the street, rendering herself unconscious. The next day, after reporting the bizarre incident, she decided to return to the villa accompanied by the local authorities. However, the villa was gone. It had completely vanished, leaving nothing behind but an empty yard. So I grew up in a small town in Canada. Just up from my house on the hillside, there was a shack. This shack was a bit bigger. Then a ute house had a bed and a desk in it. Every full moon at about 2 a.m., you could see this figure standing overlooking my neighborhood, followed by a dark, ominous laugher and cries if this thing has been hurt deeply. What's strange is only the kids in the neighborhood could see it. It doesn't stop there, though. We were all sitting in the hot tub at my neighbor's house, and the house next to his was just getting built, so there was no fence between his house and the new house. We were all talking when my buddy saw something in the basement window. He was facing the house. We all turn, and at the same time we see an old man in the window, and his smile grew to a huge size. We all saw it. Since then, nothing has happened because we all moved and went separate ways. But now the hillside has been fully developed into housing. Do you think this was an evil entity or some soul suffering? When I was 11 years old, my father decided to treat us to a sledding adventure on a logging road not too far from our home. The location boasted higher elevation, guaranteeing better snow for our winter escapade. We gathered our excitement and set off to a place known as the Five Mile Cause, named after the steep hill it featured. As we arrived at our destination, I couldn't contain my enthusiasm. The left side of the hill was adorned with towering timber, while the right side revealed a vast clear cut. At the bottom of the hill, a road emerged, stretching into the open expanse. My father, the ever prepared adventurer had even built a fire at the top of the hill to keep us warm as we indulged in the thrill of sledding. Eager to experience the rush, I decided to embark on a solo run down the hill. With adrenaline coursing through my veins, I slid down the slope, feeling the wind whip past me. Finally, I reached the bottom and gracefully came to a stop. Excitedly, I hopped off the sled and rose to my feet, ready to relish in the triumph of my speedy descent. But as I turned to my right, an unexpected sight froze me in my tracks. Two towering figures stood before me, their presence both mesmerizing and unsettling. These creatures, larger than any I had ever seen, locked their gaze upon me. In that moment, time seemed to stand still, and an inexplicable fear gripped my heart. Without a second thought, I pivoted on my heels and began walking away from the enigmatic beings. At first, my steps were cautious and deliberate, my eyes darting back to ensure I was not being pursued. But the growing sense of urgency urged me to quicken my pace. As my heart raced, I broke into a run, propelled by an instinctual need to distance myself from the unknown. My grandfather told me this story when I was a teenager. I'm 52 now. My granddad grew up in the woods of central New Brunswick in a very remote area where only survivalists go now. Their whole family lived out in the sticks. They lived by hunting, fishing, trapping, and some logging. Granddad said when he was a teenager, he and his older brother Duke were up in the early hours checking trap lines on an old motorbike. 
It was early fall. Frost was on the grass, and early morning mists still hung around the forest edges. He was rolling cigarettes with his brother, and they were out of matches, so they dipped a bit of cloth in the gas tank and ignited it off the coil wire, while Duke kicked the bike over. The sound of a bike being kicked over without an ignition is sort of like an animal call. That's how my granddad described it. Anyways, just as they started smoking their cigarettes, my grandfather noticed something bounding through the tree line toward them. Granddad said it ran in a way a bear did, but it stopped several yards away from them and stood up on its hind legs. It was still too far away to tell what it was, but they assumed it was a black bear because they are very common in New Brunswick. That's when it began walking upright toward them. As it got nearer, Granddad said it looked like a huge werewolf. His family origin was German, so this was not unknown. It got as close as 20 feet away from them and then began to eye them closely. It sniffed their smokes and then turned, hopped, ran back to the trees. Granddad said they were not scared. He said they were only shocked that such a creature was living in the woods. Granddad said it was taller than any man, had a huge head, evil eyes, long, upright ears, hands with long claws, and had hair all over its body. I can't remember what color he said its fur was, but he said it had wolf-like legs. I work as an EMT for an ambulance company. EMS has always been full of superstitions, and most of us believe in the supernatural on account of all the crazy, gruesome stuff we get to see on any given shift. Every company, every EMT, every firefighter has a story about the uh, A station that is haunted or something that happened to them that can only be explained as paranormal. For the company I work at, we have about five stations, each with their own stories. Only one or two truly scary stories, though. Mostly things like employees seeing shadows out of the corner of their eyes, getting uneasy feelings in the stations, or hearing an unexplained knock, voice, or being hissed or growled at occasionally. The station I work at was no different. The station I work at is our main station, meaning that is where we keep all of our extra resupply. So it is not uncommon for various crews to be going in and out of the station at all hours of the day. It was common knowledge that the ambulance bay was creepy at night, and people report hearing voices, footsteps, or ambulance doors opening and closing out in the garage. Now I've worked at this station for two years, and I've heard these things, but it's always been easy to dismiss this as my partner doing something out in the bay or another crew doing some late-night resupply. The only experience I've had there that I couldn't explain was I was distinctly growled at in the garage late one night. At that time, I quickly realized that the only person in the bay was me, and I certainly didn't growl at myself, and quickly left. That was all I ever experienced there, and for the most part, felt very comfortable at that station, until last night. The station is small and consists of a living room with a kitchenette attached to a hallway. This hallway leads to the garage on one side, the bathroom on the other, and at the end of hallway is a door leading to the Jewer's bedroom, which you can then walk through to get to the SR's bedroom. If you go into the garage, there is a staircase that leads into the attack that stretches above the entire living quarters of the station. Me, Junior, and my partner, Senior, are dead asleep in our respective bedrooms. All the doors closed. When I am awoken to all these loud banging noises and the walls shaking, I realize that this banging isn't just banging, but actually running. Something huge, heavy, and fast is stomping and running around in the attack upstairs. It is stomping and running so loud it is quite literally shaking the walls. Whatever it was must have been huge to have been making sounds this loud. Then it gets faster. It's so fast and loud. It is running across the entire length of the attack. It is moving faster then. Anything can move. The stomping is happening one right after another. It almost sounded like there were ten people up there, or a creature with too many legs running right above my bed. It's so fast. It's too fast. 
I'm sitting upright in my bed now, huddled in the corner of the bedroom, absolutely horrified. I get this deep, visceral, primal feeling of dread, almost like what prey must feel like when they are being hunted, and suddenly it's as if a thought from somewhere else is placed into my mind, and I just know with every fiber of my being that it knows that I am awake and that I know it's there. Like sick, twisted version of that spider, man Mimi, in between the stomping and the running, I can hear this barking, whirling sound. It's hard to describe, like a grunt mixed with the sound of wind. It is making this sound as it is running. I realize that it is moving so fast, I can hear the wind it is creating swooshing and whipping around it, and it is grunting as it is running. So now, I very silently get up, and I walk over to the sir bedroom door and try to open it, but it's locked. I feel as though I can't make a noise or it will come through into the station and kill me. I'm quietly knocking on the door. I'm crying, pleading for my partner to let me in. I'm thinking, this is so loud. There's no way she is asleep, but she is. She's out cold and I don't get a response. I decided that my partner had the right idea and I crept over to the Jor bedroom door, separating my bedroom from the hallway that leads to the garage and the rest of the station and locked the door. So I silently creep back over to my corner in the bed with my blankets and begin to text her. It is 1.45 and I am begging her to wake up over text and describing what I am hearing. She's not answering so I text her fiancé and ask him to call her and wake her up but he's not answering either. It is at this point I decide to text my mom. As I'm sitting there, you get a similar feeling to before. An intense dread, a stark realization of pure truth. It doesn't even feel like my own thought, more like a piece of truth was just slipped to me by the universe. The thing upstairs is not human. I'm explaining to my mom what I'm hearing. All these loud swishing wind sounds and stomping and running. Then I hear it run down the stairs. When I tell you, my heart stopped and my soul left my body. When I heard coming down the stairs, my stomach dropped into my ass, and I was nauseous. I genuinely thought I was going to die. I was waiting for it to start pounding on the door, and I had never been more thankful in my life because I thought they have locked it earlier. I was waiting for screaming or the door to start shaking or something, but it never came. It ran, possibly fast and hard, back up the stairs, up the stairs, down the stairs, across the attack, down the attack, above my head in circles, down the stairs, up the stairs, down the stairs, across the attack, down the stairs. It is going all over. Too fast. So now I'm absolutely hysterical on the phone with my mom. No one ever prepared me for dealing with being hunted and taunted by a demon. My mom is trying to calm me down. She asks me, What do you want me to do? I didn't know. I don't know what she can do. I don't know what to do. I just whisper, I don't know what to do. Just please don't hang up. She tells me to bang on my partner's door and wake her up, and I do. My partner wakes up and hears rustling in her bedroom, and she goes, Yeah, in a dismissive voice, and slowly walks over to the door and opens it. I literally shoved her back in the room, whipped around faster than I ever moved in my life, closed the door, and locked it. I explained to her everything I was hearing, and we go and sit on the bed. The activity is dying down now, but it is still active enough for her to hear the running upstairs, too. It is now 2.45. Another crew that gets off at 3 got to our station to put their truck away and clock out to go home. Me and my partner huddled together glued to each other's hips, hurried outside together to meet with them out in the building parking lot. It is at this point that we realize that a completely separate crew from around 23, 11 p.m., that night had not only left our truck full of medical equipment and drugs unlocked out in the parking lot in an area known for being a not-so-great area, but also left our garage door open, giving literally just anybody access to our entire station. Me and my partner are terrified and aren't willing to go back into the station at this point. The crew that's getting off at three goes into the station to clock out, and when they come back, they see us hanging out in our truck. 
They'd joke with us for a minute over the ghost and make fun of us for sleeping in the truck for the rest of the shift. We asked them if they heard anything, and to which the sar on that crew, who has been there for a long time and staunchly believe in the supernatural, says, yeah, it definitely sounds like there is someone walking up there, but he's harmless. Me and my partner are just harmless. That thing is not harmless. They leave, and we decided to call for P.D. to make sure that it wasn't some crackhead that had gotten in while the garage door had been left open. P.D. got there and searched very thoroughly and found no one and no evidence of anyone being there. It is four, and we notify our dispatch that station was cleared to be safe by P.D., and together we venture back inside. We elected to keep the truck in the parking lot so we would have to go back into the garage if we got a call or needed to make a quick escape from the demon. And together we huddle together in the living room with all the lights on until we get off at seven. I heard a few minor bumps and bangs but nothing crazy. Things that could be dismissed as house noises and what not. I barely slept. And I'm not looking forward to going back there later this week. About one o'clock in the morning, I stepped out on the front porch to put some dry food out for the cats, and evidently I scared some type of creature because it was eating off the porch. And when I got out there and shut the door, it went down the bottom of the stairs to the driveway. It was small, round. I didn't see any legs. I couldn't see its face. It didn't turn around. It had long brown hair that hung to the ground, and it started to move and it waddled as fast as it could, which wasn't very fast. It didn't have any legs, and as it waddled, it kind of moved down the driveway. It started to grow, yet taller, and the brown hair was gone. It became short hair, dark hair. The legs grew as it went down the driveway. It wasn't making a sound. And I thought, as it's going down, I'm thinking raccoon. It gets to the end of the driveway, and it's tall like a deer, and I think deer. It runs across the street. It's not making a sound. It clears the sidewalk across the street with one foot, and at that point I hear a hoof print. A hoof print. It ran across the lawn, the front lawn of the people up the street. They also have a concrete patio right after the lawn, and at that point it made no noise as it went across the patio. At that point I could see that it was growing long black air, and it was running, and it was flowing up behind it. I watched it until it got all the way past all their lights. The street was well lit. I saw everything from the bottom of my porch to the end of the driveway. Hoof prints on the sidewalk cleared the lawn. No noise as it was going across their patio and it started to grow long hair. Black long hair that flowed out behind it. I don't know. I watched it until it went into the darkness. I had my porch light on. We have a street light out in front of the house. People across the street had their porch light on, which was unusual for one in the morning. We live in a cul-de-sac. The street is not very wide. At the end of the cul-de-sac, there's a field there, and there's a creek through their backyard. And so it ran into the darkness. A couple of days later, I went over to the lady that lives in the cul-de-sac. I went in, sat down, and I told her all the things, and she sat there, stared out the window for a moment, and she said, Well... I guess things happen, and she thought for another moment and said that she sees all kinds of animals coming up from the creek all the time. When I was 13 or 14, my mother's friend asked if I would like to babysit her kids for a few hours one night. I live in a rural town, and to get to their house you have to drive to the outskirts of the town about 15 minutes up a steep and narrow hill, surrounded by a forest. Their house was just off the road. Now, if you pass their house, the road continues up into the mountains and forest and eventually starts heading down the other side and onto a main road where you can turn right and head back to the town. This is a substantially longer route if you want to head back to town also pitch black as you're driving through woods. I was so exited and felt grown up to babysit. Mum's friend was lovely and her husband was a police officer. My dad dropped me off and Mum's friend was going to give me a lift home. I was there for a few hours. 
11 p.m. or so, and all went well. When they returned, the mother said her husband, police officer, was going to drive me home. As we started off, he didn't turn right. Back down the road, the way we had come, he turned left, heading up the mountain and into the forest. I asked him, why are we going this way? He replied, it's just another way. Those were the only words he spoke to me. We sat in silence. He drove slowly deeper into the forest. When I said it was a longer route, I mean 45-minute drive instead of 15. I thought it was weird, but I was a naive and innocent kid. At one point, I asked him if we were nearly there yet. No answer. I remember thinking maybe they had an argument as they were pretty cold with each other. When they got home, he did drop me off home safe and sound, and I thought nothing of it until I was an adult and the memory popped into my head one day. I don't understand why a grown man and a police officer would take that route with a young teen at 11.30 at night. I often wonder if he had sinister reasons. I didn't babysit again. Maybe I knew deep down it was weird. Ever since I was a kid, I remember my grandma denouncing horror of any kind. Ghoulish Halloween masks, haunted houses, scary movies. I had attributed this aversion to her background and faith. She is Hispanic and a devout Catholic. She believes anything horror-related is wrong. Evil, you name it. So imagine my shock and curiosity when my grandparents shared a bombshell. Back in 1974, my grandpa convinced my grandma to see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This would be her first and last scary movie. The weekend after the movie, my grandpa, grandma, my then toddler, age mother, and my aunts and uncles decided that they would go horseback riding for the first time. Since everyone lived in Wisconsin, my family made the journey to a farm about two hours away. For the most part, everyone is in high spirits. Who can say no to a family adventure on a crisp autumn Wisconsin day? Despite the other's excitement, my grandma is worried. Since she doesn't care for horses, she chooses to stay behind on her own with my mother. When my family arrives at the farm, it is three o'clock. According to my grandma, she watched everyone get saddled up and then slowly ride off into the tangle of trees. The guide leading my family called out that the ride would last less than two hours, mentioning different trails, the need for breaks, things of that nature. My grandma figures everyone will be back by five o'clock. She waits with my mother in the car playing games, reading storybooks and trying to silence her bubbling anxiety. Needless to say, five o'clock comes and goes. No sign of my family. By this time, my mother has fallen asleep, which leaves my grandma with no way to distract herself from her worries. Finally, when six o'clock rolls around, she calls to a farmhand from her car window. No way is she leaving the safety of her vehicle. She demands to know why her family hasn't returned yet, when five o'clock is long since passed. By now, darkness has begun bleeding into the Wisconsin sky. The farmhand assures her that everything is okay and that extra paths are taken throughout the ride. He tells her that her family should return soon. Now keep in mind, this was well before cell phones were a thing. Also, a week before, she had seen her first scary movie and it had scared the shit out of her. At this point, my poor grandma feels like she's living out a scene from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. She tries to contain her worry and begins a hushed, fearful prayer until the flash of lightning that is soon followed by ear, splitting thunder. The noise wakes my mother, who starts to cry. My grandma must now not only ponder the frightening question of where her family went, but she also has a stressed, howling two-year-old to deal with. It is now reaching seven o'clock. The storm is growing more ferocious by the second. My grandma has to pee and her bladder feels like it's going to explode. But between the roar of the storm and the images of crazed country maniacs plaguing her mind, she refuses to leave the vehicle. She plans in her head that if they aren't back by 7.30, she's going to leave and find the nearest gas station to phone for help. Again, no cell phones during these days. 7.30 comes. 
Her family hasn't come out from the woods. As she's scrambling around the car for the keys, she realizes my grandpa never gave them to her. The pound of a fist against her window shakes her from her whirlwind of panic. That panic amplifies by a million when she notices a sizable brawny man peering in at her. He is wearing a jacket and the hood covers his head. My grandma says that by now it felt like someone had pushed a button and sent the world into slow motion. Everything crawled by at a snail's pace. Why don't you and the little one come inside? The man yells. His words are authoritative and carry no hint of warmth. He isn't speaking from a place of concern. He's ordering my grandma into the farmhouse. All my grandma can do is shout, Where is my family? The man responds gruffly. We're looking for them. My grandma orders him to call the police. The next words the man said made my grandma literally piss her pants. We don't need the police. As he turns to go back into his house, he says, You and the baby can come inside whenever you're ready. My grandma starts to sob wholly convinced that her family has been brutally murdered and that she and her baby will be next. In the chaos of this moment, she hears someone calling her name. But because of the pitch-black darkness and her profound fear, she knows she must be hearing things. Then she hears her name again, this time even louder. Dora, help me. It's my grandpa's voice. When she realizes this, she puts my mom in the back seat, grabs the wooden baseball bat my grandpa keeps under his seat, locks the doors, and then exits the car. Keep calling my name. I can't see you, she cried. After what feels like an eternity, she follows my grandpa's voice to his location. When she gets to him, she realizes my grandpa needed help because he is guiding my aunt across the high, rain-soaked grass. She hurt her ankle. They are both drenched from mud and rain and covered in scratches. The rest of my family is nowhere in sight. Before my grandma can assume the worst, she hears my uncle calling for my grandpa. One by one, everyone shuffles out of the wild woods and through the tall grass. Everyone is soaked in mud and injured in some capacity. Cuts, gashes, limping, unsteady. All are shaken as well. When they finally make it back to their vehicles, the sounds of running engines and the flood of headlights gets the attention of the man inside the farmhouse. The farmhouse door swings open and the brawny man comes to stand on the porch. With an amused chuckle, he drawls, Oh, you all made it out of there. My grandpa shouts, That dumb asshole left us out there and never came back. All the man says in response is, I'll have to talk to him about that. You all can come inside. His freakishly flippant and joking attitude sinks into his words. He knows damn well they aren't going into his house. My grandma begs my grandpa to leave it and get them out of here. With that, my family tears out of there as fast as humanly possible. Once my family was back home and safe, my grandpa explained what had happened. During the ride, the guide led them deep into the woods to a creek where the horses stopped for a drink. As the horses rested, the guide told my family he had to go do something and would be back in 20 minutes. My family thought this was strange, and my grandpa even anxiously joked, You're coming back, right? The guide simply gave a low chuckle and took off on his horse. 20 minutes came and went, and the guide didn't return. My family continued to wait as they had no idea where to go. They could see the sky blackening above them. They would have to make it out on their own. As my family rode off, they tried to remember the path back to the farm. They wandered aimlessly. Eventually, rain started to fall. Pulsing lightning and the crash of thunder spooked the horses. Everyone but my grandpa got thrown off their horses. When my grandpa climbed off his horse to help the others, his own horse galloped away as well. From there, it was a nightmare trying to navigate the woods while wounded and roaming through a thick void of darkness. The only advice I can give you is this. If you're going horseback riding, you better make sure it doesn't become a horseback ride from hell. My dad saw the Michigan dog man back in the 70 or 80s in the northern part of Michigan. I remember the first time he told me. I had never heard of it, but was just starting to get into the paranormal cryptid universe, and I was shook. 
He said him and a few buddies were driving up North Michigan to their other buddy's house to go hunting. When they pulled over to take a quick bathroom break, if anyone knows Northern Michigan, you know how dense the forest can be. They all got out, and as they were doing their business, one of them started howling as a joke. Then they heard something howl back at them. Very close. It happened again, and they all jumped in the car as fast as they could. As they were pulling back on the road, my dad said a dog-like creature wearing a tattered soldier uniform came from behind the brush and stood there. He said he couldn't believe what he was seeing, and it was as if time stood still for a few minutes. They continued driving away as fast as they could, which caused them to take a wrong turn and got lost. My dad said they had to sleep in the car that night so they could find their way back to their friend's house in daylight. I know my dad wouldn't make up the story. He said a few years later a bunch of sightings started coming out of the woodwork in northern Michigan as well. There's even a song about it. I'm curious, has anyone seen a dog man or any other cryptids in Michigan? So I grew up in rural South Georgia and lived with my parents and several siblings on a large farm. Most of my family grew up believing in paranormal activity, mostly due to our Native American heritage. My dad, on the other hand, was a staunch non-believer and would always discount our encounters as hogwash or overactive imaginations. My mom said for years that she would be woken during the night by disembodied voices. She said that it would sound like a room full of people where you couldn't hear a single conversation, but could tell the overall mood of the room. The activity would heighten around pivotal times in her life, death of her mom, brother. For years, my dad would laugh it off and say he's never heard a thing, even after all the kids moved out. Fast forward several years later, and my dad had been diagnosed with large and small cell lymphoma and went through chemo lost hair and lost significant weight. I stayed with him around Christmas of 2020, and I vividly remember him telling me that he is routinely wakened by the same voices that he had discounted for decades. He said that he would check the house to make sure that no TVs or radios were running else, where because the chatter was so loud. He ended up passing away from cancer in March of 2020. One, looking back on it, I wonder if the voices were warning or welcoming him to his final outcome. So a while ago, I went to my grandma's hometown in Mexico. She told me about not going to the creek at night, as there is some sort of water spirits that would steal children. I found this interesting and decided to investigate, and that day, when the sun was going down, I made my way to the creek. It was quite the long walk and isolated, but soon enough I started hearing drums and other types of instrument coming from that direction. The closer I got, the louder they got, and when I was a few yards away, it suddenly stopped, and I felt like I was being watched anyways. I made my way back home, cause I'm not dumb enough and had a terrible nightmare. It felt so real, and the only reason I snapped out of the dream was because my grandma heard me shout while sleeping and proceeded to cleanse me with an egg. It was a really weird experience and would like to find more info or similar experiences on this.